Wrapping up Tuesday's GOP primaries and looking ahead to the next round, I'm joined by Craig Crawford, politics blogger on CraigCrawford.com and author of The Politics of Life. Craig, thanks for being with us. So let's Let jump. Let the veep sticks begin. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I was going to get to that in a second, but you jumped right into it. Is it now time to begin the inevitable speculation? Who's Mitt Romney going to pick? And, you know, everybody's now saying, gee, Paul Ryan introduced him tonight. <laughs> right. well, how do you read into What do you read into this? I, I had to chuckle on my Twitter feed, Governor, uh, about when Paul Ryan started speaking, about a dozen national political reporters simultaneously s said something like, is this the VP tryout? I could just tell. I could just sense it in, the, in their tweets. They're ready to go on beef steaks. Well, let me ask you a question, though. Why would Paul Ryan give up what is now the fulcrum, the center <laughs> of the argument about the future of our fiscal policy to become the vice president who goes off to funerals in foreign lands? Why would he possibly do that? He's having the time of his life life in his current job. Well, you know, they asked Lyndon Johnson that when he was Senate Majority Leader. They yep. thought he would never take it. And he said, boys, when they show you the green valleys of the White House, you, you never turn it down. I think it would be interesting about a House member as a running mate. That would be the first time uh, uh, for a Republican running mate to come from the House since Goldwater's running mate, Bill Miller, who happens to be Current's own Steve, Steve, uh, Stephanie Miller's father. <laughs> you know, th there are two remarkable pieces of d d little data points that are amazing. I'm not sure that the Goldwater <laughs> metaphor is the one Mitt Romney wants to be hearing right now. My recollection, <laughs> right. I, was, I was only five, I got to admit, my, my recollection <laughs> is the 64 campaign didn't turn out so well for, for the Goldwater good. campaign. <laughs> But, yeah, I think they want a few deep south states, maybe. Yeah, may, sure. Maybe. I'll have to go back to the map and take a look at that. Here's the question, though. <laughs> Mitt Romney is getting the delegates. He's going to be the nominee. He's going to have a load of fun between now and November. But the polling data that we see every day is saying he has lost that center, the vital middle block of voters, women and a lot of minorities as well. But in particular, women. How does he begin to recoup it? What's the strategy the Romney campaign is looking at to somehow reclaim that centrist vote? Well, one thing that's going to help him is, and I'm, Lordy, I'm going to miss him. The, the, the GOP crazy train is, is pulling into the station now. All, all these right-wingers have been saying all this wild stuff and, and, and making the whole party look like it believed these things, including Romney. At least that's out of the picture, and he can start uh, being sounding more moderate, moderate himself. Uh, but then he's got these uh, these very conservative voters in Wisconsin. The, the number that struck me in the exit poll is of the people who said the most important factor for them in voting was to have a true conservative as a mm -hmm. Republican nominee. Santorum beat him by 50 points among right. those folks. So this problem among uh, you know in the uh, still within his party, much less the in independents in general, this problem is still there for him. Well, look, there's no question. The best metaphor of the campaign so far is the etch a sketch candidate, his own campaign yeah. manager. Or his press spokesman, whatever, whatever the title was, said, look, we'll just shake the Etch-a-Sketch and redraw the candidate. The problem he's got is nobody today knows what he stands for. If he redesigns himself to appeal to that moderate vote, to, to overcome that yawning gap he's got with women against President Obama, he may lose those conservative voters that he clearly needs in November to make up the gap as well. So he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. So in Caribbean, oh, yeah. how does he do it? I mean, wh what's the strategy for him? Well, you know, it reminds me of the John Kerry campaign in 2004. We were always bugging them. You know, he, he won the, the nomination against George, uh, the Democratic nomination against George W. Bush's reelection campaign. With the establishment party behind him, he had that locked up. He never did fire up the grassroots ideological base of the party. And the Kerry people kept telling us, oh, it's no problem. We're not worried about it because they hate George W. Bush so much. They're going to show up and vote. And, and of course, he lost that election. And I hear the same thing from the Romney camp uh, about their problem with their ideological mm -hmm. base. Right. Oh, they hate Barack Obama just so much, we're not worried about it. And that's why he is just attack, attack, attack on Obama, as he did in his, his speech tonight in Wisconsin. And of course, the president is game on. They, they started ads in battleground states uh, tying Romney to big oil. Today, the president actually said the words Mitt Romney. That's, uh, as you know, in the Masonic yeah. tongues of politics, that's game on. Right. Absolutely. You're right. I mean, clearly the starting 
gun has gone off. The president's speech today was notable for its direct attack on Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, the Ryan budget. You know, th this is going to be a very different campaign than the one in 2008. Hope and change are not the words that are going to jump to mind come November of this year. This is going to be a down and dirty, ugly campaign, negative. And I think there's no question what is missing is affirmative passion, frankly, on either side. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. as a partisan, I can say there's a whole lot more for Barack Obama than I sense on the other side of the aisle for, for Mitt Romney. But I, I got to tell you, there's not a whole lot in certain younger voters, even for Barack Obama right now, those who were so overwhelmingly passionate about the campaign in 08, eh, you're not sensing it right now. So this is not going to be a campaign filled with passion. Question for you. You started out with the VP stakes. Who is going to be the one that Mitt Romney looks at tonight and says, gee, I need help with women. I need help with Latino voters. Is there some magic candidate out there that can really do this? Well, given his character, he's going to get his PowerPoint out and do and run numbers and do something safe, like Rob Portman to to, to get Ohio, perhaps, uh, and you know maybe uh, maybe Paul Ryan's on the list. He seems a little young to me and new to the scene. Mark Marco Rubio is another. Neither one of I those really is going to help with women. I don't think. I agree, and and I, I this is a problem the party has is. Who are the women right. on the national stage in the Republican Party? McC McCain had this problem. They decided they wanted a woman. It was a short list, particularly if you have to get uh, uh, someone who's not pro-choice. All right, Craig. All right, uh, quick, quick, quick answer I'd here. Go for Olympia, I'd go for Olympia Snow if it, if for me. Yeah, now, now, there's an interesting choice. She's given up on the Senate. I got yeah. an even crazier one. Well, what, what do you think? Maybe Sarah Palin coming back? She's been tested. She, uh, you know, what do you think? How crazy is that? Or Mike Huckabee, I'll top you one. Cra another crazy one. <laughs> All right, yeah, let me tell crazy you. One. <laughs> Craig Crawford, politics blogger on CraigCrawford.com and author of The Politics of Life. Many thanks. This story keeps on going. As we say about these primaries, this is a bad sequel to a bad movie.